we are mission led, which is one reason why we have yet to sell out. I think you'd agree, Anne. And <laughs> that's why we don't accept many offers from big multinational conglomerates. I'm fending them off left, right, and center. It's just. <sighs> If I, you know, Stop, just give guys, me a minute. Please, oh my God. Please. And if any multinational conglomerates are listening, don't email us and offer us giant sponsorship deals. Just don't do it. Don't, don't, don't. Come on. I've asked nicely. Hello and welcome to The Big Con, the podcast dedicated to demystifying and simplifying the world of strategy, exploring its impact on businesses and individuals who've either harnessed it for success or perhaps missed the mark. I'm Emily, Harvard degree candidate. I'm Dale, big business nerd and self-proclaimed content aficionado. (laughs) And we are bringing you in on The Con, sharing the valuable lessons from both the failures and triumphs of those who've come before us. And Dale, you've got a little bite-sized piece for us today. Correct. And then we're revisiting a season three fun one that we were only in a few few weeks ago. We're going back to Airbnb because your episode inspired me to dig more into that story because there's so much exciting little nuggets and fun stuff in that world. So Em, during the Airbnb episode, you asked whether or not I believed that Airbnb continues beyond the current founders or in their current fashion. Mm, I did. I want to bring some evidence that further says why. All right. So I suppose at this point, though, we should probably tell listeners if they haven't listened to the Airbnb episode to do that as a precursor to this, or does it not matter? It's going to help, but <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, like, don't stop. Go. You could probably listen to this and then be like, oh, what's he talking about? And then go and listen. So yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, but obviously everyone is listening to every episode ever because of course we're a big deal. Correct. <laughs> now I want to bring some evidence that further says why without Brian Chesky, Joe Jebbia and Nathan Ble- Blazadchik, and I should be able to Blazadchik. do that name because yeah, I believe he's, he's probably from my brethren. But Airbnb does not continue (laughs) to look like it is without these guys. And sure, when you bought us the Airbnb episode, you showed us how they dealt with the impacts of COVID on the travel sector. But this doesn't actually seem as personal as the story I'm going to bring you today. Imagine, if you will, that you're Airbnb. You've just graduated Y Combinator. You've just booked your one millionth room. You're on track to reach 10 million. You've just closed a funding round that's put your company at a 1 billion plus valuation. Things Mm -hmm. are looking real good, but it's all at risk of being taken away from you because of something that companies across Silicon Valley fear, which may destroy your company's value. Uh You know how much I love Silicon Valley myths and stories. So Uh I'd like to present to you today an urban horror story. Let me set the mood. And for those who are are, are watching us on YouTube will experience a lovely visual gag. (laughs) For those who aren't, he's got a torch under his chin. I'm sure you can envision it very, very well. The tale of the Samwer brothers. Because your time may be up when they come knocking. In the shadowy corners of the internet realm where innovation and duplicity dance hand in hand, the Samwer brothers emerge as elusive puppet masters. One stub does the clone factory for their talent in bringing successful ideas that already exist to new markets. Picture this, it's 1999, the early years of the internet. The Samra brothers launched Alanda, a German online auction site that feels a lot like eBay. Meg Whitman, <laughs> friend of the show, CEO of eBay, is so <laughs> impressed that just within 100 days, she buys Alanda for an astounding $60 million. What? But this is just the beginning. The Samra brothers have a pattern, find success elsewhere, recreate it in a new place. Groupon. A rising star falls into their realm of awareness. City yeah. Deal emerges, a dark twin of Groupon, taking over Europe with 600 employees in 80 cities across 16 countries. As City Deal spreads its influence, Groupon faces a tough choice. Only six months into the game, Groupon agreed to a deal with Rocket Internet for around $100 million. It's a twist of fate that leaves Groupon with gains, but raises some eyebrows. The Samra brothers, creators of digital intrigue, continue their journey in the business world. The big question remains, who's the next player to join in the dance? Well, it's Airbnb. Um, that's, that's <laughs> as I oh said God. before. But what I'm talking about here is, is copycats. And so mm. imagine this place in which they just look at your website, look at your company and go, well, we'll just do that. We'll just do that for yeah. Australia. We'll just do that for here. Let's be clear. Copycats and dupes and clones in all facets of the business world, they're not uncommon. 
Like there are things okay. that happens. It's a brilliant thing about the free market and the capitalist society that we live in. Mm-hmm. Someone is doing something and someone else thinks, hey, I can probably do that a little better and, you know, take a bit of the pie. And usually it's a time when the customer wins. It's pretty good. Company tries to compete on price, on product set, and it's definitely in the weird gray area of ethical. We saw it a lot with Uber for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly in the states you had uber you had lyft you had all these different ride sharing companies and it was great because you could get around for about four dollars to anywhere you wanted to go and it was a really mm-hmm. good space so airbnb they're <laughs> reveling in their success they're happy and then all of a sudden out of the shadows comes windu it's born out of a company called rocket internet it's kind of like a startup incubator similar to y combinator at the same time not at all like y combinator they scale fast on the original company's coattails. So they're, they're using that kind of Airbnb model and they're striving to kind of coexist in competition. And again, the customer's winning in this space. And the hope is that they can sell this to someone else really quickly. Most of the time where this happens is they're hoping to sell to the company that they're copying off. So they're hoping to sell to Airbnb. Sure. Now, I'm going to tell you how fast Wimdu is going. Wimdu is founded in about 2011. And by 2012, Wimdu had 100,000 listings in 150 countries. So they're oh, pretty wow. much almost on par with Airbnb at a similar time. And for anyone who remembers the Airbnb episode, they struggled for a long time. Mm-hmm. So it took them like ages to find product market fit. And so what's the Samra brothers done? Or the, this Wimdu company? They look at it and they go, oh, hang on, why don't we just, just do what they're doing? Because that seems to be working. At the same time, Airbnb has been asked to diversify. And there's a recent interview with Brian Chesky, who's being asked he's like well the next natural step of that was being asked of Airbnb would be hotel bookings but he was really quick to shoot that down the young team's really confident in what they're doing and their idea and they don't want to be just another hotel booking website they love their shared house model that they they're pursuing and that's the whole thing about Airbnb but it was really vital for them to expand internationally that's kind of the ask they were being taken seriously they were they had that billion dollar valuation and okay. so for Airbnb their whole mindset and this is a quote directly from Brian Chesky was if no one else was going to do it no one will until someone mm. did yeah. So how did it start? Airbnb notices all of a sudden that a whole bunch of website scraping data is coming off their website. And all of a sudden, their hosts and their listings are being called up by Wimdu with Wimdu saying, hey, list, list on our website. Less than excellent behavior from Wimdu. There's also some dodgy stories of them doing unsolicited phone calls, but then also putting out listings that actually weren't even, that they had the agreement with the hosts to have on there. Not great. There's roughly 572 reported cases of these these unsolicited calls. The Wimdu website is a perfect replication of Airbnb, effectively mirrored. And there's a quote from one of the designers or one of the investors that says that every time the Airbnb changed a pixel on their website, Wimdu was really quick to copy. What's mm-hmm. worse is it's working. Mm. Wimdu secured a $140 million investment, one of the most significant startup investments for a European company at the time. A lot of this money comes from the Samo brothers, from my spooky horror story that I uh, told okay. before. Airbnb is feeling really sorry for themselves. They need the European mm. listing. What kind of travel company is American only? So the Airbnb management team wobbles over to Berlin to meet with the Wimdu team. And they recount this story of seeing teams of people in a factory type environment. And they've got two monitors up. On one monitor, it's got the Airbnb website. And the other bo- monitor, it's got Wimdu. And they're just copying it. Designers and engineers are just copying the website. Uh, to be honest, it's a bit of a power play move. It's uh, kind of like, we will outplay you. Look what we can do here. Look at how brazen we are. And to be honest, I wouldn't have the constitution to remain steely based. That would be something where I'd be like, oh, no. Yeah. The Germans have got us. <laughs> but it is so brazen, like, that there wasn't even, like, a shred of embarrassment that... This is what they were doing, you know? Well, that's the whole thing. They force Airbnb and they force companies that they like this into a choice. Do yeah. they buy Wimdu, which is Wimdu's hope, or do they fight? Any guesses? What do you reckon they did? That's based on the founders. I say they fight. What do you reckon that fight would look like? Why do you reckon they fought? They have recently just bought a company as well. So they've, they there is practice of them buying listings. Companies. No, I think if they were going to fight, my moral high ground would, I'd be like, I'm not giving you any money for copying everything that I did. I might look to see how I can differentiate that wasn't as easy to just copy. And I think you touched a little bit, moral high ground and the company culture. That's something Mm. that, this is why I think the the company doesn't look like Airbnb without these three founders at the start, because Mm. they didn't want to buy Wimdu because they were just really afraid of buying a company that would fundamentally change the culture of Airbnb. Mm. It's a giant beast, which Windu was becoming, and it wouldn't change it for the better. And their values mm. are clearly not aligned. You've mm. got 
one company who's like, let's get rich really quick and scale fast and do things that are not great. And this other company who's got this lovely mentality of respecting their hosts and their guests and clear communication. It's where I want to introduce a concept that Chesky has spoken about at nauseum, including the book, The Airbnb Story, Mission vs. Mercenary. And it's something that I think we've touched on a few times this season. The Airbnb team believe that they had a mission and their mission was to create a world where anyone can belong anywhere. Whereas the Windu team, they had a job to do and their mission or job was make money, get paid, get out. As a reminder for our listeners, the mission mindset is like being on a quest, driven by purpose and loyalty to an organization or a goal. It's all about dedication, a commitment to goals beyond personal gain. And if I was going to sum up this season's stories, that alone has been a bit of a theme. Now switching gears to the mercenary mindset, when you're in this mindset, it's a transaction. A business deal, it's not really about the greater good or high cause. It's about personal gain, plain and simple. And that gain may be, cool, we have a job to do, get in, get out. There's room for both in these spaces. But mercenaries are in it for themselves, more or less. They're high guns and they don't really have a strong allegiance to a large purpose. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying that there's they, they're fit for a certain purpose versus yeah. that longevity. In a nutshell, the mission mindset is about purpose and loyalty, while the mercenary mindset is more about that transactional engagement. Mm. It's the difference between fighting for a cause and fighting for a paycheck. Sometimes you got to do both. For longevity, though, sustainability and the greater good of a business the evidence is seemingly stacking towards being mission-led and we'll go back to our first episode around leadership and i think i quoted the book good to great and jim collins who did a whole bunch of study in a whole bunch of businesses of businesses who went from good to amazing to great and empirical statistical evidence the whole thing was around the companies that succeeded had a mission that they got uh, behind and everything was uh-huh. behind that mission so the evidence is there. The Bitcoin podcast mission is to bring strategy to the masses, removing confusion, mm-hmm. making it approachable and understandable for audience. We are mission led, which was one reason why we're here, why we have yet to sell out. I think you'd agree, Anne. <laughs> and that's why we don't accept many offers from big multinational conglomerates. Which are just other are reasons. sending them off left, right and center. It's just, <sighs> if I, you know, Stop, just give guys, me a minute. Please, oh my God. Please. Like there's, there's other reasons we don't do it. Uh, but that is up there. And if any multinational conglomerates are listening, don't email us and offer us giant sponsorship deals. Unless, of course, you were aligned with our mission. So just don't do it. Don't, don't, don't. Come on. I've, I've asked nicely. Back to the battleground zone. Windu v Airbnb. So Chesky, he's fighting. He's taken up this quasi lead of international role. He's hired a dozen country managers across these untapped markets, Barcelona, Milan, Copenhagen, Moscow, Paris, and Sao Paulo. They develop an Airbnb. They develop Airbnb in a box. It's pretty much like a, a playbook for each country, a model that many other companies have kind of iterated on in years since. Working with each country manager to build out their local operational guidelines and the processes so, so that was still Airbnb, but with that local flavor. They have a big launch, they do big press events, there's community building in that space and community meetups. They're building on the culture of the company and the company in the country. Mm. And if you think about it for a second, Airbnb is a really complicated business model. You've got this company, a fabric, if you will, that as a customer or a host, you expect a consistent experience, but you don't actually own or control the product. So there needs to be strong consideration around what are we offering that is a consistent Airbnb experience so that the customer keeps coming back. It must be really difficult. We spoke a bit about Airbnb's focus on design, and another lovely anecdote is how they approach translation. If you're traveling to Japan, for instance, from an English-speaking country, and the Airbnb listing is in English, you might all of a sudden assume that the host also speaks English. So you create a communication issue when you arrive, leading to a really poor experience. And so how do they manage this? They show the listing in the local language with a really clear optional translate button. Mm. This care and focus always fits into their mission statement. And when you're one of the world-renowned short-term rental companies that do not own a single property, the care and focus you must take is incredibly thoughtful. It's a hard line to tread, but evidence suggests they did it right. Airbnb pushes aggressively into the Asian and Australian markets. They make acquisitions of companies that align with their business or could acquire specific reasons, i.e. they just wanted the property. And Windu kind of continued for seven years. They putted along. But after a few mergers, the original team kind of leaves because I feel like they they lost their original mercenary goal of, well, we, we can make money, we can sell this real quickly. They're mm. nothing now but a kind of a cautionary tale. They're gone. Yeah. Windu bought them 
So they're a hotel franchise, picks them up as part of a, a bucket of companies and effectively shuts them down while they're cleaning house. So mm. Airbnb wins in this ground. And I think it's because of the care they took. The interviews since shows them how this was, they, they viewed it as personal. They went from the approach of going, we need to own this international market. Mm. But Em, I thought we'd take a break. Let's have a yep. quick think around whether there's something we can touch on regarding what happens when someone copies your company. Em. Yeah. So I agree. The trio of Airbnb, that's what makes them them. So fair enough. Uh, and I think they did the right thing in this space. I think they, they, they stood the line, particularly aligned with their, yeah. their mission. Called the bluff. And what would you do if someone someone tried to copy a company? Or would you be someone who would copy a company? Uh, definitely not the latter. I would find that too boring. Like that's not, I wouldn't have the motivation to get up in the morning. So I'd be like, oh, God, just a like. A challenge though. But if you saw someone doing something and you're like, oh, I can do it better. And I feel like that motivates me a lot uh, of the times is that I, think that's, I, I think can do that's, it better. I, th- I think that's a different I think that's a different thing than literally sitting there copying code across yeah. with the goal to yeah. be bought out. I think I can do it better or I can offer more value is like literally at the heart of what why people start businesses. Which is the which is the delineation between mercenary and, and mission in this space. It's I'm gonna deliver more value. Airbnb looked at the hotel model and went, I can do that better. I don't think that is necessarily bad thing i think like copying someone and you know when you look at shines and the timus of the world who are stealing like local designers designs to create really cheap versions but Mm. then they have the cool designs i find that offensive but then i suppose it's capitalism but you know whatever in terms of if i had a business and my mission was to create value for my customers which i think is what airbnb were hoping to do First thing, and I touched on this when you sort of asked me, what do you think they did? The first thing would be to looking at my key differentiators and what makes me really good at what I do. So like, you know, the sw- the old SWOT analysis gets a lot of flack, but I think that in this situation- There's a reason it's like fundamentals. It works. Yeah. The very, very least will allow you to get back into the fundamentals of what your strengths are. And when we mm. talk about Airbnb strengths- not just talking about their idea. Their idea was great, but that's not their only strength. Strengths were design, as you said. Their strengths were their culture, um, their ambition to create value. Um, they really leaned into those strengths and they looked at, okay, well, obviously there's a threat here. So the, the T part of the SWAT, there's a threat here. What actually is the threat? So the threat is... That these people are like using extortion to make us buy them. That is like essentially what it is. It's like we're going to copy mm. you until you buy us. And so they're like, well, we, and then they evaluated the threat. So when you look at a SWOT analysis, it's not enough just to write down that this is a possible threat. You have to look at how are they threatening us and in what way, what are the outcome, what are the possible outcomes from mm. this? Probably would have had a good a good thought around they have no desire to actually overthrow us. Like if the, if if they were growing up, became this m- immediate thing that was even bigger than Airbnb, they'd have to change their entire operation because that's not mm. what they were striving for. So Airbnb was like, all right, well, the threat is literally that we have to buy them, but we don't want to do that. So let's go to our strengths and what are our opportunities? So our opportunities in an international market might be the thing like the translate button or, you know, how do we understand those international markets better? So I think in this case, a SWOT analysis, but but a good one, not just a, oh, I'm good at this and I'm bad at this and this, you know, like really diving into what those things mean and where your opportunities lie out of all of that. I would also say that another thing that you need to do if you are being threatened by a copycat, this goes to that small, this is particularly big for small businesses. So when, mm. when you do have the team moves of the world copying your designs or your or what you're selling, what the business owners attempt to build up is brand loyalty and awareness of the fact that they're the ones that own the IP. People get really passionate about supporting their local brands that may get overthrown by something that comes along to jeopardize 
their business. So I think that's the other thing that Airbnb had was brand loyalty. And we saw examples of this in the um, in the other episode where we talked about what it did when things went wrong. The customer did an Airbnb and they had a really bad experience, like had ratings and all this sort of stuff. I don't know anything about Wimdu, but I imagine if they're a copycat company, they're not going to care as much if a customer has a bad experience. Let me talk about differentiation as well. There are two types. One is differentiation in itself. So being different, standing out in, in ways that makes your product better. You are the best at this. And there's also cost leadership, which is basically you're the cheapest. And so sometimes when we go to Kmart or Walmart or whatever your local version is in your country, we look at, okay, we're, we're not going there for quality. We're going there because we need an item and we need it to be cheap. So that's a version of cost leadership. Whereas, you know, if we're going to local boutique furniture place, we're probably going there. We're probably spending a lot more money. Hand sources their furniture from the deepest realms of wherever. Yeah. Yeah. So we're probably, and we're probably willing to, and we understand that we're going to spend more money, but we know that we're going to get the best product that's not going to break in the next year or so. It's not, it's not, it's not something we're going to throw out. When we look at that kind of thing, Airbnb really leaned into the differentiating factors of of their business and why they're really good at what they do. And so a customer after a while is going to go, oh, well, I get I get my money back with that place if I have a particularly bad experience or a, a an Airbnb host is going to go, well, I've got a really cool network and that's where all the customers are going because they like it. So I'm going to move over there and fit into their culture. So I think that's probably... I think that's probably what they did. Final comment I make for your wrap is, say you are, sure, copycats are a copy thing. Actually, you're copying the right thing because yeah. it just feels like they copied the surface level. They copied the website, they copied the shiny bit, and they just didn't think through the bits underneath that made the company mm. sing. It just shows that how the care, the focus, the mission-led approach that Airbnb took in this space wasn't something that could be replicated easily without mm. that focus. And so mm. advice for copycats you horrible, horrible, grey <laughs> human beings. Um, do it properly. And you can't. That's the thing. You can't copy a culture. You can't do it. it just doesn't work. Can't copy a culture. So so don't That's try. That's what I want in a T-shirt, Emily. You can't copy a culture. Culture is, culture is made. It's fostered. Yeah. It's Trust me, white people have tried to copy cultures a lot of times. <laughs> <Spicy>. <laughs> Take us out quick. (laughs) Well, listeners, there you have it. You understand a little bit more of the con and we hope that you have avoided copycats and also seeing Dale with a torch under his face. If you haven't already, please subscribe. (laughs) Watch us on YouTube, guys. Come on. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Big Con Podcast. It not only supports us, but means that you will get all the latest episodes straight to your device. Do not keep all the fun to yourself either. Share the con around. Your mother, your aunt, your best friend's brother. Tell them to check us out on all their favourite podcast apps. For any further details, head over to our website, thebigconsultingagency.com and sign up to the mailing list. Bye for now. See you guys.